Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Simons. I'm the superintendent of schools for the East Greenbush Central School District. And we're so glad that you had an opportunity this evening to join us for a presentation and discussion of the proposed school opening plan. We are very excited this week because today we welcome back all of our faculty and staff for our opening day sessions as we prepare for your students to come back on September 9th. As you may know, during the course of this summer, there's been a lot of information flow changes and things that have occurred at the state level that have made uh, an impact on our district's planning. We do feel very confident that our plans as they are going to be presented to you this evening are solid uh, and that they will ensure that our students, faculty and staff and our community is safe. Additionally, we are very much looking forward to welcoming all the students back for full in-person instruction. And we wanna take an opportunity tonight with our administrative panel here to share with you the details of the plan and then take your questions. Uh, I wanna introduce everyone who's with us this evening. We have Mike Harkin, who is our Columbia High School principal and we thank Mr. Harkin for being here. We have Peter Goodwin, who's operating the technology. He's our director of technology and he's done a lot with his department to provide the technology that's been necessary for remote learning and connecting with students and families over the course of the last couple of years. Mark Adam is our public information specialist. So when you receive an email from the district, an update or a bulletin, that's Mark Adams' work in coordination with the district administration. Mr. Jim McHugh is our assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and also oversees professional development, federal grants, and many other areas. And Linda Wager is our Director of Business and Finance, and she's been instrumental in helping us not only to put our budget together for this year, but to, in, to develop some federal programs, which will provide more resources, staff, and support for your students as they transition back. So hopefully we'll be able to touch on all of those areas as we present the information this evening and answer your questions. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen and I will spend approximately 25 minutes sharing some information with you and then we will proceed with your questions through thought exchange. I'm going to ask the members of the panel if you can see my slides. Very good. I yes. Starting to get used to doing this. So this meeting is intended to provide information for our high school parents. We may have uh, parents of students at the elementary school level or the middle school level who were not able to join our previous meetings who are here with us. Much of the information will be pertinent to all levels. As I indicated in my opening remarks, we are excited to welcome all of our kindergartners through our seniors back to full-time in-person learning for the school year. We will not be operating under a hybrid model which we were required to do last year because of some of the social distancing constraints. We're offering full-time in-person learning for all of our students at all, of level, all of the levels. Additionally, our school opening plan is based on current guidelines and recommendations provided by the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the New York State Education Department, and most recently, Directives issued from the New York State Department of Health as they relate to mask wearing in our schools. And we are working regionally with all the school districts in our BOCES, specifically within Rensselaer County as well, and quest our BOCES to implement very similar plans for opening school in September, on September 9th. We are monitoring the infection rate in Rensselaer County we had hoped, given the optimism of last spring, infection rate being very low, that we would not be where we are right now, but we are at about 4.1 on a seven day rolling average. Our county, along with all of the counties in New York State, are currently considered by the CDC to be in a high transmission zone. And that is based on the information that the CDC has regarding the rate of infection spread associated with the Delta variant of COVID-19. 
Almost 70% of the county's population, ages 18 and older, are fully vaccinated. Approximately 68.3% of eligible students, 12 years and older, are fully vaccinated and according, with, according to the CDC's data. So our county is doing a good job in making vaccinations accessible for those who are eligible and uh, who choose to become fully vaccinated. We are following many of the same, excuse me, many of the same strategies as we did last year with a few exceptions. We will continue to conduct temperature checks at the high school level. Those temperature checks will occur through the thermal scanning machines that we purchased last year. Uh, those machines allow the students to transition in in a safe and orderly manner pretty efficient in terms of verifying that those students are not coming to school with a fever. Additionally, I know that there's been a lot of discussions, controversy, variants of opinion regarding the wearing of masks. The state has made masks a requirement for all students, all faculty and staff, and all visitors to our schools, including contractors. We will have a universal masking policy in all schools, in all classrooms, which will provide for some mask breaks during class and while students are eating lunch. And we'll talk about the mask break parameters as we move through this presentation. Social distancing. You may recall that last year, for the whole school year, we were unable to have all of our students come in in person five days a week. We made some adjustments throughout the year to accommodate those students that were determined to need that extra in-person support. However, due to the six feet social distancing guidelines, and the limitations of space, in combination with the requirement that came out in the spring that we would need to cohort students, that means assign students to the same classes with the same group of other kids, we could not implement the three feet social distancing. This year, the CDC guidance and the guidance of New York State is we can have our classrooms set up with our students located three feet apart. That will provide a sufficient uh, amount of space to ensure that all of our students can be served every day. Regular cleaning and disinfecting will continue on a daily basis. The cleaning and disinfecting of desks is no longer required between classes in accordance with CDC. That will help to transition our students from one class to another and maximize instructional time. We will continue to emphasize good hygiene to all of our students and our staff, practicing respiratory etiquette and hand hygiene, as well as making sure that our parents receive reminders to screen your child for symptoms every day. We will not be using or requiring parents or students to fill out the application on your phone that was required last year or to submit the paper form. We're simply asking our parents to be diligent about ensuring that your students are not coming to school with any symptoms of COVID-19. People, including our employees, should stay home when they're sick. We are talking with the county and other districts, including Questar BOCES, about implementing testing. At this time, the county has not received final approval for the expenditures related to testing. The county has a $3.8 million grant to assist schools at remaining open for in-person learning. We are working on that plan, and when that plan is developed, we will share it. But testing will not be required of the majority of students when we start school. However, we are implementing testing in our athletic program and we are requiring all students, regardless of vaccination status, to participate in high risk sports this fall, which includes football, boys and girls volleyball and cheerleading to be tested once a week. And we are seeing cases. Face masks, the type of face masks that are permissible within our schools in accordance with CDC include cloth masks or surgical masks 
and those masks should be worn properly, covering both the mouth and the nose. We will be reviewing these expectations with students during the first few weeks to ensure that everybody understands the rules. All students, staff, and visitors inside the schools, including on our school buses, will have to follow the same mask guidelines regardless of vaccination status. Bandanas and neck gaiter style masks will not be permitted in school. Students will be provided mask breaks when seated in class and socially distanced. Those breaks will occur at the discretion of the teacher and they will last between three to five minutes. Those breaks should be provided in every class. Masks will be optional when the students are outdoors on school property. Social distancing is three feet of physical distancing between each of the desks within the classroom. All schools in the district are able to comply with this social distancing requirement and bring all of our students in five days a week. The district contracted with an outside vendor last year to review issues that may be occurring with our ventilation and air quality. Through our study, we implemented several steps to ensure that we are increasing the level of fresh air brought into our schools every day, pushing out potentially contaminated air at faster rates, and ensuring that our unit ventilators are properly working and our air filters have been upgraded. We run a purge program that brings in a high level of fresh air every morning through opening up all of the dampers and turning up all of the fans and uh, unit ventilator motors. And then we do the same when the students are and the staff are dismissed. We also run our exhaust fans and our um, HVAC system uh, during the day at higher rates than what is expected uh, by New York State. We will continue the regular cleaning and disinfecting of the buildings, the buses, and the high touch areas. As I mentioned earlier, classroom desks are not required to be cleaned in between student classes. Uh, the information on the CDC website for K-12 schools indicates that based on their studies, there is a very low risk of individuals contacting COVID-19 through surface contact. So those standards have been adjusted to comply with CDC, which will also facilitate our ability to conduct in-person learning. On the buses, all the students and the staff, including our drivers and our bus aides who are assigned, will have to wear masks. We will keep the windows and the roof hatches open to provide as much ventilation on the bus, of course, as weather permits. We, and we will be continuing the same cleaning and disinfecting that was done last year after every single bus run. Seating arrangements for students are being made to ensure as much physical distancing as possible. Later on in the meeting, we'll ask Mr. Harkin to talk about the arrangements for lunch and the cafeteria setup. We continued layered, mitiga layered mitigation protocols as recommended by the CDC including hand washing. We will have hand sanitation stations around the high school. We will be limiting mask removal to only the duration of time when students are eating. We'll be cleaning and disinfecting the cafeteria in between the lunch periods. And we will make sure that the ventilation systems that feed the cafeteria are working properly. Athletics has been a topic of discussion for the last month or so among school districts within our league and within section two in accordance with the cdc we have to put additional parameters in place in order to be able to operate high-risk sports cdc indicates that we should when we are located in a high risk transmission zone we should implement testing of our student athletes we made a determination to continue to offer football, volleyball, and cheerleading and implement the testing as a requirement of participation. We will also have voluntary testing for students in the moderate and low risk sports 
as we start school. Approximate timeline for that testing to be available is mid-September. In all cases, whether required for participation in a high-risk sport or encouraged for students to participate in low to moderate sports, parent consent forms are required in order to implement testing. Our nurses are doing the testing. It's the antigen, Binax now antigen test. It's a rapid test. Uh, it can be, the results are back in 15 minutes and parents are only notified in the event that their child tests positive. No spectator limits are in place right now in conversations with the Suburban Council League. Uh, no districts at this point, maybe with the exception of Albany City, are considering spectator limits. Uh, we are also going to continue to require those spectators, including parents who attend games, to, con to have information that they were in attendance. We're going to do that rather than having you stop and sign up on a sign-in sheet. We are going to make available to you a QR code, which will take you to an app on your phone. You can fill out a simple form, only takes a few seconds, and we will have a record that you were in attendance at that game. Should there be an issue where somebody attended that game who later tests positive or indicate symptoms of COVID-19. We ask everyone for their cooperation at our athletic events to ensure that we can continue to conduct those events safely for both our students and our spectators. General music, chorus, and orchestra must wear masks. They will maintain three feet of social distancing during instruction. We want to provide opportunities for our general music students to sing, our band and chorus groups to rehearse as they typically would, in consideration of the space that is available to conduct those rehearsals and ensembles and in coordination with the music departments of each of the districts within our uh, larger districts within our region. Uh, we are implementing the three feet social distancing, but we are asking all students to remain masked and we will be using bell covers, which are masks for our musical instruments. They go around the horn of the instrument and they prevent or reduce the uh, potential spread of COVID-19 through aerosol contact. Outdoor instruction will occur as weather permits. Physical education will continue to follow CDC guidelines with six feet of social distancing. PE classes, as we did last year, will be encouraged to bring kids outside as weather permits. Arrival procedures at our high school, very important. Uh, we received encouraging progress today on our front steps. You may be aware that the staircase leading up to the entrance of Columbia High School was removed and replaced this summer. We have assurances that that work will be complete and uh, students will be able to use the main entrance as well as another entrance uh, uh, off the West Lobby. Mr. Harkin will detail this a little bit more in our discussions. We want to make sure that our parents don't drop off students prior to 710 so that we can accommodate the buses coming in, which come in earlier, and also our student drivers need to arrive between 7 and 710. So we want to get the buses in and started, student drivers in before we start the parent drop off. And we hope that everyone will uh, understand that. We want to get people in safely, and we also want to have um, the ability to have those students coming into the building and do the temperature checks and proceed with the distancing required between students. Masks will be required at all times while in the building. And again, through monitoring of our administration, our monitors in the halls, we will be encouraging students to have three feet of social distancing as they're waiting for procedures such as temperature checks. Masks will be three feet apart. Mass breaks will be three to five minutes in duration. For now, lockers will not be utilized and students will be able to carry backpacks. We are concerned about students congregating at their lockers, potentially in close proximity to one another and um, the increased probability that infection spread could occur. Students will be staggered and released from classes to reduce congestion in the hallways. 
Not all of the students, every period will be let out at the same time. Students will keep right in the hallways and in the staircases to avoid congestion. There'll be signage and reminding students to do that. And we'll have administrators and monitors making sure that the students don't congregate in the halls. PE classes we've already spoken about. Students are not required to change for gym, so they will not need to use locker rooms for physical education. In the cafeteria, <clears throat> excuse me, we have the cafeteria set up, uh, ready to go. And as of this point, we'll not be able, we will be in need of using any extra spaces such as part of the gym. Contact tracing will be done in coordination with the county health department. We are still in the process of receiving complete information from Rensselaer County regarding how that contact tracing will work. We know that parents, staff, and the administration are all concerned about the need to reduce the number of students who are potentially quarantined as a result of the contact tracing. It is encouraging to know that the CDC has included an exception for students only from the quarantine requirements. In the K-12 classroom, a close contact would exclude any students who were within three to six feet of an infected student, as long as both the infected student and the exposed student were consistently wearing a well-fitting mask. So if your child was sitting next to somebody who tested positive for COVID, if they were wearing, if both your child and the infected student were wearing the mask, students would be exempted from quarantine. That rule should significantly reduce the number of children that were quarantined. You may recall that last year, right before the holidays, we had to shift to full remote learning for a few days because of the number of students that were quarantined and the number of staff members who were uh, anticipated to not be in class due to quarantine or COVID. We feel that that issue will be uh, reduced significantly as a result of this CDC exception. Additionally, only those students who are quarantined through the County Department of Health will receive alternative instruction, which will include the ability of students in grades six through 12 to live stream into the class, to follow along with their normal period by period schedule and also receive any assignments through our Google tools. At the kindergarten through fifth grade level, we will provide tutoring and access to class assignments. Again, the district is working with Questar, BOCES and Rensselaer County Health Department to develop a testing program for students. There are a number of discussions occurring now that we have a new governor about mandated testing. At this point, testing is not mandated in schools for either students or employees. In the event that New York State changes the requirements and some level of testing of employees and or students is required, we will take steps to put those plans in place and inform our community. Right now we're considering voluntary testing as a way to provide data on the potential community spread, particularly among students and staff that are asymptomatic. And we are also studying point of care testing, which might be a way for students and staff members who may be experiencing symptoms to be tested right in school. And we're hoping that, that this testing program will enable more students to stay in school and fewer absences if impacted by illness. The full remote program option that was offered last year to our families is no longer being offered. In accordance with state requirements, we are required to make full remote learning available for any students who are medically qualified. We created an application that could be filed with the district. It is available on our website. The program is limited to only those students who are medically qualified and approved by the district in consultation with our district's medical director. The form will require parents to talk with their primary care providers, and the form is required to be signed and filled out 
providing the medical basis for remote learning by your primary care provider. Questar 3 BOCES will be providing this program. That program will ensure that any students who are approved receive the courses that are required to graduate with a Regents Diploma. Questar BOCES program is not equipped to provide all of the elective courses, college credit courses, AP courses, and the full program of studies that we offer at Columbia High School. This will be a separate program run by Questar 3 BOCES for a limited number of students who are medically eligible. We plan to continue to hope that we can provide events for our students, our parents. Uh, at this point, we are currently developing the calendar. We're hoping that uh, some of the in-person events that people look forward to, most notably our students, can occur this year. We are also permitting outside groups to use our facilities as long as they adhere to the health and safety requirements of the district. And we will ensure that face masks are required for indoor events and optional for outdoor events. We continue to hear information regarding the vaccine. We want to make available this information to our families. Uh, all of the vaccines are available and widely accessible in our county. And if you want more information on this, you can go to www.vaccine.org or simply go on the Rensselaer County Department of Health Facebook page. And that information is available as to where vaccination sites are uh, located. At this time, I thank you for your patience. I'm going to ask Mr. Adam to initiate the thought exchange. Uh, we're going to take some time for you to uh, post your questions. And then uh, with the help of everyone here, we will answer as many as we can uh, with the time we have remaining. Mark Adam. Thank you, Mr. Simons. At this time, I'll share my screen. And we can begin the Q&A via thought exchange. Mr. Simons, do you see the thought exchange screen with the purple bar and the QR code? Not yet. All right, we had a similar situation last night, so we'll just give it a few seconds. There may be just a short delay. While we're waiting for that to come up. Here we go, we got it. All right, good. Okay. So there's a couple ways our viewers can join the Q&A. One is to go on our website. I included a link on our website to submit a question for the Q&A. And you can also go to tejoin.com and type in the nine digit code you see on your screen. And the question we're asking is, as we approach the new school year, what are your key questions and concerns regarding our preliminary opening plans? So you can visit tejoin.com, type in the nine digit code, and then you'll be able to write a question or a comment. At that time, you can start to rank the thoughts of others and we will address the most popular questions. So I'll start the timer, give everyone a couple minutes to write their questions and rank the thoughts of others, and then we will bring this back to our panel.
All right. Since we have some thoughts in there, we will begin the Q&A. I'll leave the thought exchange open so folks can continue to write their questions. Our first question, will we be notified of positive cases on bus routes? And Mr. Simons, I would just extend that to anywhere that we would have positive cases, whether that's in a classroom, athletics, or on the bus. We are planning to provide the same type of general notices to parents that we did last year. Uh, once school starts, uh, we last year we provided notification if a child was on a bus uh, where we were informed that a student uh, tested positive. We envision doing the same thing this year uh, in accordance with whatever the County Department of Health directs us to do. Uh, in classrooms, we would generally provide notice of the, uh, to those families of those students who've been identified as a contact by the County Department of Health. And then we would make a general announcement that uh, there was a case in the school building. We walk a very careful line between communication and transparency and student and family privacy. And so when we consider how to communicate and what to communicate, we want the parents to know that there was a case, but we have to be mindful of the uh, privacy of students. So um, in general, we will be notifying parents of cases. Uh, the county will follow up the notification of those students that have been identified as contacts and uh, in the event that there are questions about a particular matter, once the parents receive a general uh, announcement, they certainly can call the school principal or they can call my office. Why is there no social distancing on school buses with the highly contagious Delta variant? Many of the changes that occurred this year are based on the recognition that occurred last year that in some cases, New York State and CDC guidance really impacted the ability of the schools to provide in-person learning. As the CDC learned more about infection spread and also weighed the risk of schools, uh, the school environment, they determined that schools were some, were some of the safest places for kids and people to be in general because of the protocols we put in place. There were no instances of infection spread that occurred from contacts on our buses last year or within our school buildings. That could be said about many school districts across our country. And New York State and the CDC, in developing their guidance for us, weighed the impact and the risk of potential spread of COVID-19 against the impact of not being able to provide in-person learning for students, many districts across the country, never offering in-person learning throughout the entire school year last year. And they determined on balance that it was safe for more students to ride on the buses. Our schools, are following the same requirements for buses that the CDTA and other municipal buses follow uh, in accordance with mass transit guidelines. A couple questions about lunch. Uh, how will lunch work at high school? And secondly, will there be an opportunity for students to eat lunch outdoors while weather permits? I'm gonna ask Mr. Harkin to describe the entire lunch plan uh, as specifically as possible and then address the specific question about eating outdoors. So um, for the cafeteria, we will um, social distance three feet, alternating seats uh, in our cafeteria. So traditionally a table of 12, we'll now be able to seat six people. They won't have anyone directly across from them or directly next to them, but a seat over or a seat diagonal from them will be full, filled. So they'll be able to sit at a table with six people. Um, the seats will be assigned, but students will be able to choose their seats. So once they have decided who they want to sit with for lunch, 
the monitor will record who's sitting at that table and who's sitting in that seat. And we can kind of trace where the students are and where they are eating lunch. We will use the courtyard to eat, um, weather permitting. Uh, the, our courtyard is not that big, but we think we can get about 25 students out there. So we will rotate that up opportunity when we can to have students go out in the courtyard. And we've done that prior, in prior years before the pandemic. We usually start with allowing seniors to go outside and use the courtyard. Um, but we plan to you know, allow the students to pick their seat. We want lunch to be an opportunity for them to relax. Um, we plan on having them take their mask off for the 15 minutes while they eat. And when they're done, to put their masks back on, um, do any work that they want to do, socialize with the person there. But we want those masks back on after they eat 15 minutes um, to, for, for their safety and the safety of everyone at their table. Thank you, Mr. Harkin. What if a student or family is not comfortable attending in person, especially when positivity rates at 5.7% and no other medical reason to go remote? Um, just to well, clarify, our, our county rate is 4.1% on a seven day rolling average um, as of the other day. Right. There is always the potential that the positivity rate could get to 5.7%. The district is gonna to continue to monitor the infection rate Right now, our goal is to have a large majority of our families have their children attend in person. Uh, that goal is consistent with New York State Education Department's directions and the CDC. So uh, we can't offer full remote this year and ensure that we are able to provide in-person learning, catch kids up. Uh, we've had some kids that have had um, uh, significant academic impact as a result of the limitations of last year's requirements. We put more resources in to support students to be successful at the high school, middle school, and elementary school level, including additional academic support and tutoring that is available. Uh, so, we made a conscious decision to put our resources and our efforts into our plans to ensure in-person learning for the large majority of our students. The only options right now are you can uh, complete the application form, uh, consult with your primary care provider, uh, but we are not offering an option right now simply based on the comfort level of our families. Uh, we want to ensure if you understand that we have good health and safety protocols in place and we see strong benefits for the kids to be learning in person and we realized over time we meaning all the public school districts virtually across the country that in-person learning offers more opportunity for the students to be successful to connect with teachers to connect with peers and uh, that virtual learning and remote learning while offering some benefits to students uh, is not, was not as successful in meeting the needs of all of our kids. And so uh, we've had to limit uh, that option uh, in the way that we are. Mr. McHugh, anything to add on uh, some of the steps that we're taking to ensure that uh, the supports are in place for in-person learning, academic uh, sports. We've increased our learning resource center. So uh, for both English and mathematics, uh, we've expanded opportunities for our learning resource center to be open to ensure that regardless of when a student may have a study hall or a lunch, that, that additional support is in place. Um, we've also um, added an additional uh, part-time increase to our social studies department to support students through global history. We know throughout New York State that global history is uh, one of the more challenging regions for our students to pass. Um, you know, one of the things I will add is that we run over 300 courses at Columbia High School. Um, and we offer various levels. We take some of our math courses and we spread that content into a two-year uh, course for our students. We call it a stretch. 
uh, just to slow the pace down for some of our students that need that slower pace. And we have 27 courses for college credit. We're not able to offer um, all of those courses and all of those opportunities for students in, in a hybrid or uh, a, a full remote environment. So um, we know the social emotional learning component that you know our students are um, better in school with that socialization piece and, and that in-person contact with our teachers. Thank you, Mr. McHale. All right, uh, we have a question through the chat room on YouTube. Where are the kids allowed to put their bags with their sports equipment while they attend classes? I want to Mark. give that one to Mr. Harkin. I know the answer, but I want to get everybody in here. Yes, we, we use our wrestling room um, in, the, in the back of the uh, athletic wing. You go down to the athletic wing and you go past the athletic trainers into our wrestling room. And we store bags in there. Mr. Leonard and his staff will have it sanctioned off or squared off by um, teams. And the students will place their bag in there and their bag can remain there for the day. Um, if we have an overflow, we've talked about assigning students lockers in the locker room. Um, our high school locker rooms are, are larger spaces. Um, so if we have to, we can over, we have an overflow, we can use that. And then we'd have our PE teachers monitoring that area. It's also a well-ventilated area. We can open the back door to the, the school and allow air to come in while they're entering that in the morning. But we really think that we can get everybody in the locker room or in the wrestling room to store their stuff successfully. Also, some teachers in first period have allowed students that have small bags to keep it in the back of the room for the day. Um, and there's areas in some of the classrooms. We've also put stuff in guidance offices. Our students are pretty creative in finding a way to store that. But the wrestling room would be the primary area for, for students to store their athletic equipment. Thank you, Mr. Harkin. As a follow-up to that, how will you secure book bags with cell phones when they are at PE and can't use lockers to protect their belongings? Well, I'm gonna say in general that students are responsible for their own cell phones. So if um, they are in school, uh, they are responsible for securing them or don't bring them to school. Mike? The backpacks will be left in the gym. The gym has uh, video surveillance of, of the entire area. Um, the students usually have their phones on them or in their pocket. Uh, they won't be doing an activity um, that will require them to do excessive running around or sport, some kind of activity where their phone would fall out of their pocket. Um, I anticipate in the fall for them to be doing some out, outdoor games similar to these we saw, we saw online with cornhole, um, can jam, games like that. So a lot of times they will have them on their on themselves, but they can leave it in their backpack. Their backpack is secured in the gym. The gym is locked. Once they go outside, there's only one entrance down by the physical education wing and they lock the gym and they take the students outside when they're not, they're in there. And the, um, the bags again are watched by the, the PE teachers and also our video surveillance system. Mr. Harkin, in the gym class itself though, is the question. Um, and as I reread the question, I have a better understanding of it. When kids are in gym, they can't be carrying their cell phones around with them. So right. I, 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 did, I misunderstood the question. My response was based on that misunderstanding. What, what do they do with their cell phones when they're in gym? They can put them in their backpack and put them in the bleacher to, to store it. Or I okay. the teachers the teachers will allow them to store it in their offices during that period. Okay, thanks. I apologize. I misunderstood the question. I interpreted the question as the kids were leaving their cell phones down with their sports equipment in the gym. Which I, All I right, next question. Cool. What if positive cases rise, will school switch to remote? Uh, we do have to have plans in place to ensure that the event that the infection rate increases, that we can shift to remote. Uh, we have a lot of experience uh, based on last year. Uh, we have the technology arrangements, having conversations with all of our staff about the need to be prepared in the event that this happens. And as we work through uh, getting the school year started, uh, we will be developing various scenarios and sharing those scenarios with our community. Uh, we're hoping that doesn't happen. Uh, we're encouraging that everyone follow all these other um, Mitigating strategies that we have in place, including considering vaccination. Um, 
there is a level of differentiation occurring by the county for vaccinated students versus unvaccinated students when it comes to contact tracing. Uh, the experience of the district so far is that the uh, students who are vaccinated may be permitted to come into school as long as they are masked, that they would mask for 14 days and that they um, receive a COVID test within three to five days. These are the students that are exposed through sports. There is the exemption of the students who may be sitting in class near uh, someone who's been identified as a positive case. So all of those factors, quarantining, how many students are quarantined, what the impact of COVID-19 is potentially on our faculty and staff, those are the factors that would force the district to go full remote on its own or if ordered by the county because there's a widespread infection spread within our schools. That did not occur last year. We had no incidents of infection spread within our school. It was the quarantining of students and the unavailability of staff due to COVID-19 during a period of time when the vaccination was, vaccines were not available. And we're, so we're hoping that the situation will be better, but we are developing plans to have to pivot if necessary to full remote instruction. And there may be different scenarios. How will students who do not have a lunch period eat if masks must be worn in classrooms? It's a good question for Mr. Harkin. Yes, um, if that is the case, we did this last year, they could take the first five to 10 minutes of a class that they're heading into a, um, like a PE class if they have lab that day, they can come down to the main office, my secretary will review their schedule and we'll assign them a five minute period to go into the cafeteria get something to eat or eat their lunch that they brought quickly and then head to the class that they need to head to. All classes are important, obviously, so we try to pick one that will impact the least if they miss. We certainly don't want them missing a class that ends in a regions exam or requirement for graduation, but if they have an elective or a phys ed or a lab that they can afford to be two or three minutes late to, um, the kids were great about it last year. They get a sticker right on their ID card it denotes that they're allowed to go into lunch early, get their lunch, eat, and then leave right away. So the monitors know where they're headed. Um, and we'll have that system again in place this year. And it was really successful last year. Do we know how many students and staff are fully vaccinated? We do have information on the students who are fully vaccinated. Our nurses uh, have access to that information. We have approximate information on the number of staff. Honestly, one of the issues that schools in New York State are working through right now, trying to get a better interpretation from our state is whether or not we can require employees to provide us with their vaccination status. Uh, as recently as today, uh, I was part of an email exchange uh, in response to some of the new governor's proposals uh, schools are trying to organize in the event that there is some level of differentiation. For example, the state is considering requiring unvaccinated staff to be tested once a week. We would have to know who those staff members are. They're considering other similar requirements for students. So we do have access to the data. Uh, we try to limit uh, our uh, use of that data or release of that data until such time as we have better guidance from New York State. Uh, but you know, the, the, the levels of vaccination are uh, pretty on par with uh, the county and the state data. Will there be a late, will there be late buses for students who stay after school? I believe that we will be operating those. I don't know if Ms. Wager knows about that. Uh, I'll ask Ms. Wager to comment. Uh, last year we had to 
do that only on a limited basis because of the involvement of the hybrid model. Uh, Linda, do you know the answer to that question? I am not sure of the um, answer, but we may need to limit that based on our driver shortage as well this year. If you know anybody who's interested in getting a license to drive a school bus, please refer them to us. We are, we've had a very um, aggressive recruitment effort and we're short about 10 bus drivers right now. Right. So we will be able to bus the students to school. We will be able to do the athletic runs uh, as typical. We bus kids to a lot of locations outside the school district uh, by law. But if you, um, and I will, we will check into this issue and we'll get an answer and we'll put that information out on our website. As a follow-up, this would be for Mr. Harkin. Will there be clubs and after-school activities this school year? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We plan to have all the clubs and activities that we've normally had. Um, there'll be safety protocols for each of them. They'll follow the same social distancing and mask requirements. Uh, in the fall, we'll try to be outside for as many of those clubs and activities as we can, but we have started, we will start meeting with those advisors next week and going over safety plans, submitting those for approval and clubs and activities will probably start the second week of school. Um, and, and speaking with the bus garage, they anticipate having the late runs on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but like Mr. Simon said, it's dependent on the drivers. One of the things I wanna address, Mark, before we go to the next question is, um, Throughout this whole process of COVID-19, going really going back to the spring of 2020 and operating our schools, um, schools in service to the students and the families have invested a lot of resources to implement these protocols. And uh, we're encouraged by the fact that last year, outside of our general fund budget, the federal government and our state provided us with resources to be able to add extra supports. Some of the equipment, the supplies and materials that are necessary, for example, to, op to open up your cafeteria differently and operate that differently, to clean and disinfect the buses. This year, we're hiring different people, new positions to support students. And I'm gonna just ask Ms. Wager, who's been so patient on these meetings, to um, give us a quick summary of different opportunities and supports that are in place this fall that we're funding through the federal grant. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the extra activities that we're going to be adding for students after school, as well as the academic support. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Uh, as Mr. Simons was saying, we, we um, do have the benefit of federal funding that we can spread this year, next year, and even part of the third year. Uh, so we do intend to have summer school for three years in a row. Uh, we also are um, we also are planning to have some extra interest activities, such as uh, an archery course. Uh, we also are bringing in a trap and skeet program, uh, as well as project adventure, which will lead to some field trips for students. Our hope is that. We want to re-engage all students and families and, and we're hoping to be able to promote some interest areas where um, a, a student who, who may not have found their, their niche quite yet might find some uh, interest in these activities. In addition to those activities, we are uh, purchasing additional technology, cleaning equipment, Mr. Simons talked about the thermal scanners earlier. I just received an email this evening that those have arrived. They'll be distributed to uh, the buildings and so they'll be ready for next week. As well as we are providing some additional resources for students regarding social emotional needs. We are bringing in extra library sources, resources, uh, specific books for social emotional learning. And um, we are, also purchasing, we're purchasing software so that we can identify and assess the learning gaps. Thank you, Ms. Wager. I appreciate that summary. You're welcome. Couple questions asking about the full remote program. 
we as a school district need to start opening our eyes and listening and following current data, not last year's because this is way different times. You can offer full remote. Um, there was another one asking for a full remote option as well. Okay. The district is not going to offer a full remote program at this time unless students are medically qualified. The rationale for that is we wanna be consistent with our instructional program for all students. Last year, despite everyone's best efforts, families, parents, staff members, teachers, and administration, many kids did not benefit from remote learning. In many ways, we made adjustments to bring the kids that we could back to school for as much time as possible. We serve a diverse range of student needs. Some students did very well in remote learning. Many did not. We saw increases in the percentage of students who failed two or more courses at the middle school and the high school level. We screened our students for academic intervention in reading and math at the younger levels, and we saw higher levels of needs. Some students, particularly middle school and high school students, did not attend remote classes as consistently as we would have liked to support their academic success. Weighing all the factors and doing a whole assessment of remote learning last year, in combination with collaborating with other districts within our region, our Questar BOCES, and considering the state guidance, we made a determination that we are not required to offer full remote learning as an option. We are required to do it for students that are medically qualified. And we've arranged an option with Questar BOCES that cost on average $10,000 per student. Uh, we believe that that limited option is the best way to go for our district right now, considering all the variables that we've been discussing. In the event that the situation develops to a point where we feel like we need to make changes, we will do so. But at this point, as we open up the school year, we are espousing the benefits of in-person learning and we are dedicating our full resources, including human resources, personnel, financial resources, and uh, energy and time to making in-person learning as safe as possible for the large majority of our students. Remote learning will not be a choice at this time. Mr. Simons, it's 7.30. Uh, can we respond to a few more questions? We'll do a couple more. Yeah. All right. There was a high risk sport exposure when tested. What is the quarantine guideline? An exposed student had to sit out Friday and returned Monday. We've had some limited experiences with the new requirements that the county has put in place that differentiate between vaccinated students and unvaccinated students. And uh, during our testing, uh, we did have a situation where some students uh, tested positive, and we we're also informed uh, today of a case involving a student athlete. The state, excuse me, the county is differentiating the rules based on whether or not that student was vaccinated or unvaccinated. So we do a contact trace. We determine who the students uh, uh, were in proximity to, who the case was in proximity to. We determine who those students are and we provide that information for the county. Hypothetically, if we provide a list of six students that may have been in close proximity to an infected student, uh, we provide the breakdown to the county of those students within that group of six that were vaccinated and those that were unvaccinated. The direction we have right now is that the vaccinated students can continue to play sports as long as they are masked, even outdoors. They have to mask for 14 days 
in any public setting. So if they go to the grocery store, they have to wear a mask. And on uh, sometime between day three and day five, uh, they have to be tested. That testing is available through our district. Unvaccinated students have to quarantine for 10 days and cannot participate. Those are the guidelines uh, for uh, contact tracing right now as, they, as the county has um, enforced on the district. Is it okay to bring snacks if you are staying after school for clubs or other activities? Those determinations are made by the club advisors, Mr. Harkin. Yeah, I, the cafeteria, we will have monitors in the cafeteria after school. Um, if your student is waiting for a sport that starts between two and 3.30, you could bring a snack and have it in there. Um, the advisors in there will have the student social distance just like they are at lunch. And then again, it would be on the the um, advisor would have to allow it because we would need to clean that desk and clean that area. Um, there will be no eating in class this year. Students will be required to eat in the cafeteria. Um, like we mentioned before, if they don't have a lunch, they'll go in quickly and eat, but we will not be eating in classrooms during the day. Thank you, Mr. Harkin. How about one more, Mr. Adam? All right. Will vaccinated staff be wearing masks? Yes, there is no differentiation regarding the mask rule for either unvaccinated and vaccinated staff or students. Everyone has to wear a mask regardless of vaccination status while indoors at our schools. So I appreciate the opportunity this evening to address your questions and concerns. I know that we're going to have a very successful school year as we prepare for September 9th. I appreciate that everyone understands that we're going to have to remain flexible to adapt to circumstances. We may receive further guidance from New York State with our new governor and some of the directions that she is setting for our New York State Department of Health. You may recall that this year, the exception of information received Friday regarding mask wearing as a requirement, the New York State Department of Health has issued no regulations and no guidance for schools. Under our new governor, our new governor has indicated that she is speaking with the, with the State Department of Health and legislators about potential changes. So the plan that we present tonight is subject to change based on the district's ability to respond to the Delta variant and any potential state mandates that may come our way. They could arrive between now and September 9th. If so, we will reevaluate that information. We will share any changes with our families. We encourage our families to keep the lines of communication open with teachers, with our administrators. If there are issues, particularly at the beginning of the year, when we can intervene and help your child to be successful. The first point of contact should always be the teacher. The teacher is the person in the best position to help your child. If there's a problem, our teachers want to know about it. In the event that that problem cannot be solved successfully, then you would contact Mr. Harkin or one of the assistant principals at the high school. If the problem can't be resolved at that level, you certainly should understand that I'm always accessible and my central office administrators that are here today are accessible to try to help and support students and families so that we can have a successful school year. And ultimately you can bring issues to the attention of our Board of Education. So I appreciate everyone's uh, act active involvement this evening. I look forward to welcoming your children back to school and we will keep the lines of communication open so that we can continue to work together to partner to support your child's success. Thank you very much and have a good evening.